Join me in prayer as we go into our message time here at Elevating Life Church. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you to thank and praise you for total truth. We ask for an awakening to to give eyes to see completeness through your Son, Jesus Christ. Wash wash away corrupt thinking and, and wrong methods to express a reality that honors you. We yield to your way, truth, in life to fight the destructive influence of two-faced living. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may have a seat. Hello and good morning. Y'all looking good. Look at you guys are smiling this morning. Good for you. It's nice and sunny. See some new folks here. Good to have you. Good to have you. All right. Um, uh, let's jump right in. Turn in your Bible, please, to the book of Titus. The book of Titus, chapter 1 this morning, <clears throat> continues our year's theme, understanding the Bible, God's epic story. We know this. It's, it's, we have a story, but aren't you so thrilled that we get to connect to God's story? And, and that's our priority And so our theme continues for this year, 2022. Here we are going almost all the way through. Can you believe it? My goodness. Woke up this morning. It's good night. I didn't get it light out until 7. I know it's fall, right? And so so we're continuing this theme. We're going to finish it out strong for the end of the year. And by the way, we have a wonderful theme coming for 2023. And Sherry and I are going to be departing for our 10-day offsite, getting some things together for next year. And we're excited about that. So uh, be standing by for that. Our team knows what it is, and perhaps you do. But at the same time, I think a lot of people don't know. So uh, we'll leave that kind of as a cliffhanger. How's that sound? Uh, So uh, we have something to look forward to. It's going to be exciting uh, next year. So now let me say this. As you're getting to Titus chapter 1, And for those who may be wondering who I am, uh, my name is Drake, uh, one of the pastors here at Elevating Life Church, uh, the senior pastor. And let me just share with you, I'm absolutely thrilled to be sharing God's word uh, this morning. Now, before I jump into the message, I've been asked to um, just kind of put an ask out there from from me to you. Uh, This next week is our annual trunk or treat. Uh, We're expanding that experience Uh, to a carnival, and we're doing a haunted experience, if you will. Uh, We need all the help we can get on that. Uh, And so we're going to ask people, if you can come out and be part of this, uh, we're short a few people, but uh, I believe they need, uh, who's my my voice piece here? Uh, What's what's the time we need to be there on what day? Actually, Carrie will have all that information. Okay. The 29th. 29th, okay. So don't get into it is what you're telling me. Carrie will do it. All right. But understand how important that is when Carrie brings it up. Okay. So I wanted to put that out there. Uh, big event for us. So please, please, there's an opportunity to truly uh, uh, to get the good news of Christ out there and also be an expression of what God's excellency or his glory looks like together because we're more better together. All right, let's jump right into the message. You know, I get out of my element. I'm no good at it. So let's get back to the message. How's that sound? <laughs> Let's jump right into it. Let me get my notes ready here. Now, let me say this with our message this morning. My hope and or desire uh, with this message today is to sharpen our perspective, and that would be our worldview, of God's happiness or His glory. That is, let me say it this way, that's His delight or the delight of the Lord that creates health and, and robust actions towards developing a culture of integrity now aimed at of course god's satisfaction i also want to do this i'm going to give you the key to ensuring you we don't fall into the trap of two-faced living that takes us out of god's glory to help you flourish in life whatever you're doing so that's my hope with our message today Uh, the message that I've titled, uh, Living Good with the Bad. There it is, Living Good with the Bad. 
So with that, let's begin with reading the main verse or core verse this morning that leads us into God's integrity of happiness. Uh, We can say personally, but more importantly, where we're going with this message, collectively. Let's see uh, where this leads us. Titus 1.5 is our opening verse today. The Apostle Paul, if you're familiar with his writing, he is a leader, a director uh, of the movement of Christ in his day, and he has people under him. One of those people is Titus. He's a trusted colleague and friend under the leadership of Paul, and Paul, the one directing, gives this message to Titus in a very interesting situation. Paul says this to Titus. The reason I, Paul, left you, Titus, in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Now, isn't it interesting here at the very last thought there, a part of this thought, as I directed you? It doesn't say as Jesus directed Paul. Why is that? Because we know this, right? The one thing we know about Paul is we trust Paul is following Jesus Christ with all of his heart, mind, and soul. And he has been now put in this role to direct the movement of Christ as Christ is at the right hand of Christ. Are you with me? We need to see this because many people want to say it's just me and Jesus. Just me and God. The Scripture does not teach that in the sense of God's plan and or salvation. Do you realize that? And we need to do that because there's a lot of people that have difficult time taking simple directions. And Paul says here, as I direct you. But of course, Under the authority of Christ. Paul says in other places, follow me as I follow Christ. This is Titus 1.5, which opens up our message this morning. Now with this, verse read, and we're going to be in Titus the whole time. But with this opening verse read, I have a question for you, Carrie. Now if you're new here, the tradition is uh, we start with a question. So let me share the question this morning. It, it is a, it's a doozy, I will say that, so be prepared. Here's the question. Have you ever felt absolutely miserable about being a phony baloney about something in life? Let that sink in. Let me, let me read it again. Have you ever felt absolutely miserable about being a phony baloney, we can say two-faced, about something in life, especially as a Christian? Whew, let that one sink into the soul this morning. Well, tell me this with that question asked. Did God make or create, create us in His image to be two-faced or ambiguous in the faith or life? Not even for a moment. He desires for all of us to be true, to live a sincere and genuinely happy life together. Take that in, and I want you to think of our reality today, the outcome, the results, because there's a lot of Christians that are not happy. And it's beyond me because God wants you happy and don't let anybody tell you otherwise because if you do you're going to fall into the trap as we're going to see some people did in Crete so let's see how this all happens let me begin with a story once upon a time there was a crazy place where people called themselves Christians. They were liars, self-indulgent, and a, since all the kids are gone, I can say this now, a sexually promiscuous bunch of people. They were also thieves and known for backbiting 
and gossip and harsh living. In fact, they called harsh living tough love. They primarily thought of themselves and believed they were living by the golden rule when actually they were living by the glass rule. To the outside world, those looking in, the good news of these Christians, if you will, said they believed in... Let me re-say this. i got to say this right. To the outside world, the good news these Christians said they believed and lived, were living by, looked pretty unattractive and insulted the truth and grace of God's reality. In this once upon a time world. And to a watching world, this allowed them, the world, to make bad and, and nasty accusations about the faith, which in turn rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. For the most part, belief in Jesus by these Christians was divorced from their behavior, especially in public. But even more radical is it was totally eradicated in their private lives. Behind closed doors, marriages, families, churches were filled with conflict, abuse, neglect, hate, yelling and screaming. And the list goes on. On and on. Relationships between Christians were strained and tightly stretched to the point where these people felt that happiness was adverse treatment and hurt. Are you with me? Again, in this once upon a time. So unbelievers now on the outside of this were turned off to the good news of Jesus, and rightly so. Why would people reject the world's way in favor of Jesus if there was no compelling evidence of transformational living by those who claim to be Christ followers? These people in this once upon a time place were two-faced. Meaning they believed one thing, but acted out another. They were phony balonies. In this once upon a time place, John. Now isn't it interesting, the place I'm describing isn't in modern day times. But a large island off of the coast of Greece. In Paul's, the Apostle Paul's day. The island is Crete, as we read, where Paul assigned one of his most trusted co-workers to restore order to the network of churches that were put in place about 66 years prior. 60 years, give or take. They were a little younger than who we are today. We're about 100 and, what is it, 16? But you can see how quickly the bad snowball can create some bad times in time. The so-called Christians on the island were no notorious <clears throat> excuse me, for treachery and greed. And very little was given to Jesus' ministry that Paul had established years prior. And most of the people would serve, not the ministry, mind you, but serve through making money through what they did to support their two-faced ways. And it's interesting because on that island, the, the highest bidder, the employer, who would pay the most money, would get the skills and the talents and the time and everything that goes with that. The highest bidder 
would usually get the honor of the best workers, whereas God would get their second best. It is absolutely sad. It was a flea like, flea, what's that? Flea market mentality. Well, God gets the second best, not their very best. Now, doesn't it sound remarkably like our history and our culture today? The, back, the backdrop? It's amazing. Very little has changed. Don't forget, the Word of God is for generation. It's a living, active Bible. And God knew this. Generation after generation, we're going to fall into the same issues that we see Paul and the church falling at the beginning. The reason it falls, though, is because mature people in the faith, or, or elders, as Paul puts it, step away. It's remarkably like our history today. It sounds just like it. And that's why we must hear and apply the message Paul gave Titus about the problem of two-faced living in the Christian culture of Paul's and Titus' day. It's the same today. We've got to listen. We must hear it and apply it ourselves to gain goodness and happiness overall. Or just let's just close everything down and live like a bunch of cretins awaiting our doom. Who's with me? Now, like in Titus's ministry in Crete, under Paul's direction, today many people, many call themselves, many people call themselves Christians, but are ruining the faith with their wrong perspective uh, and, let me say, immoral actions. And what I mean by immoral actions is don't go to the prisons. Go to where we sit, where we're not obeying and making choices based on God's principles. That's the immoral act the Bible is talking about. And unfortunately, it's the, the, the exaggerated and the radical that gets the blame. But we've got to take the beam out of our own eye, don't we? So God's desire for all people is to be happy, objectively speaking and subjectively, and to be fulfilled by His way, His truth, and His life. I don't know if you've ever heard that one before. Let me say loud and clear this morning, just as Paul assigned Titus, it's time to put things back into order personally, and more importantly with this message today, collectively in our day and age. It's time to get rid of the double-mindedness, the simple-mindedness that goes with that as well, uh, and what that is in the book of Proverbs. And we need to get mindful and heartful Christians connecting again in God's total truth, where they become elders or mature in the faith to accomplish Jesus' movement in our backyard as Scripture directs it. Who's with me this morning? Now, why do I say this? Because we want to be successful in living in such a way that is profoundly good for others and deeply good for ourselves through the good shepherd to hit the target of God's glory. We can say happiness or what Genesis 131 says to hit the target of being very good ourselves. When we hit that target, happiness is guaranteed. There is no question about it. We want to do so for, let me say this, for as many people as possible through the truth and grace of God. Just as Titus did in Crete. Titus 2, 11 through 15 says this, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation, this happiness, this glory to all people. Are you with me? He goes on to say, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Let me say this. Nothing wrong with desires, urges, strengths. But when it's not done with what we're going to see here in a moment, it becomes worldly. That's why it says it teaches us to say no to ungodly, uh, ungodliness and worldly passions and to live, what's the next word hyphenated there? 
self-control, which is one of the fruits of spirit. That's what controls our passions and our desires. God wants us to experience pleasure. Nothing wrong with that. Don't be stoical. Don't throw that out the window. That will throw a lot of people out of the church. But we want to do it to live self-controlled, upright, righteousness, and godly lives in this present age. Who's with me? Who's with the Word of God? While we wait for the blessed hope, maturity, sanctification, and, and salvation, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. One of the reasons why we teach, learn the wonderfully weird commands of Christ. It will build character or Christ-like character in who you are. And that should be your number one goal. And if that's not it, you're missing the mark. Because this is exactly what it's talking about. We're developing the character of Christ in us. Not the character of culture or society, mom or dad or whoever. Even Paul would say this, not me either, but of Jesus Christ. That's why we're so dogmatic here at Elevating Life Church. Jesus, what was the song? Is that the center, at the core of all of this? We mean it. We just don't throw Jesus around like hey, another fad. And if you've been here and you say, I'm committed and engaged, we're going to keep you accountable to it. As Paul directed us in Titus, and of course, more importantly, Jesus. Where did I leave off? My wife's not here to tell me. <laughs> Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness, to purify himself a people. If you're a people of Jesus, raise your hand. A people that are His very own. Eager to do what is good. Are you eager to do what is good, objectively speaking? Not good to whatever, however you design it? Uh, design, uh, <laughs> never mind. These then are the things, we make mistakes around here and we don't judge ourselves or get embarrassed about it, Okay. So thank you for forgiving me if I need to be forgiven there. These then are the things you should teach. Encourage. Now, I want you to grab onto this because I'm intentionally doing this today, just to let you know. To encourage and rebuke. I know this. This type of music, or music. I'm not in your shoes. In this type of message, it's a rebuke type of message, is it not? I'm sure you're sensing that. But there's reason. The scripture tells us, yes, to encourage, but also rebuke or just, or correct, with all authority. That word all authority, and Jerry, you're here today, you use the word knowledge. That's somebody who's knowledge, knowledgeable in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. With all authority. They get it. Those people that are directing you and aligning you and moving you with Jesus. Do not let anyone despise you. Now I need your attention here. This is going to be radical. Because that word despise means don't let anyone knock you out of that priority. Because I promise you, your spouse, your, your family, biological family, people at work, your friends, will do everything they can just to knock you out. And then you lose the focus. Because people despise that and then in return despise you. It's sad because this is how many Christians live today in our culture and our society. Gone. Church never no longer becomes a priority. Life, the world, is our priority. We're missing the mark, folks. Do not let anyone despise you. Now, if you're wondering how to live a good life, with all of the bad going on, as I just shared, around you, it's done through, let me say this, God's plan or His strategy of goodness. When a Jesus moment is directed and aligned with God's orders, or we say His precepts, through mature people, and that's the elders that Titus is going to appoint in all of this, uh, in their roles and responsibility, uh, these elders, as Paul shared in the main verse, people who are obedient and ready to do whatever is good and to slander no one. If, if, 
if we want to do this or when people do this, uh, they're peacemakers and kind and considerate and always gentle towards one another. That word gentle is learning how to use people skills, folks. Gentleness is not this wimpy, your tail around, you know, your tail tucked under going, nobody loves me. I had to do that this week. That gentleness is with knowledge and skill that you can really work with people. Don't you appreciate a doctor that has good people skills? Appreciate people that have good people. That's what that means. With all gentleness towards everyone. God's strategy of goodness and happiness then can be fulfilled. you got too many people trying to do it their way. And guess what? When all this happened, that is the mark of a good Christian. Personally, in their marriages, in families, in churches, in communities. These Christians are then being victorious in what it means to be an authentic, meaningful Christ follower in the time, space, and place He has given us to do so. Does that make sense? Are you with me? Now, when it comes to the bad aspect of living out the good and God's strategy to to do so, let me say this, and some of you guys are waiting for this. The key is this now, because we're going to do this and we're going to do it God's way, but there's a key to it because we've all been there, yes? Every one of us, and some of us might still be there. I don't know. But the key is this for us who are mature. The key is remembering at one time you too were foolish and disobedient and deceived and enslaved to all Testing one, two. Hey. She was back there. She turned me on. I didn't say that, Doc. (laughs) (laughs) Back to what I was saying. We lived. (laughs) Never forgetting you lived in in this in this way was my point, okay? So the again, the key, I think you're understanding what I'm talking about here. Grace and truth are the turnings of the key that opens the door to Jesus. Not only to you, but to the community. So it's love, not harshness or tough love. I am so tired of that term. Is key. Of course, let me say this. Uh, as, as, Titus, uh, as we're thinking about Titus going into Crete, uh, the same condition. This only applies to those who reflect, or at least going after the integrity of Christ today. And are not currently living out a double standard life or being two-faced in the faith. Because here's the reality. I'm a realist. I'm a realist. The reality is, somebody's listening out there, maybe somebody here today, you're going to hear this, and you're going to go right back to your way of living. And there's not that. We love you. Um, but I want to speak to those who truly want this to happen. And not just tickle your ears this morning. That's not my point today. But this applies to those who reflect the integrity of Christ today and are not currently living out that double doubled standard life or being two-faced. Again, let's bring our question back to mind here. Have you ever felt absolutely miserable about something, or being about being a phony baloney about something in life, especially as a Christian? The only way to resolve phony baloney or two-faced living is through God's benevolence and, of course, His grace and mercy and persistence. His love, folks. His love generously, please hear this, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
And it's only the perspective, not your perspective, not cultures, but only the perspectives and truth and practices and performance of Jesus personally and collectively uh, will do and is the only way to justify, not, don't rationalize your life, the only way to justify life and hit the target of happiness successfully now in this time and for all eternity. There is no other way. And you can challenge, you can test God. But I promise you, you'll be here two, three years going, I should have listened. It's time to listen. That means to hear and apply so that then we can live it out. There's too many people just hearing and not enough living. I'm speaking to those who are focused in the integrity of Christ, not for those who just want to do this part time. So let me stress this today. This will only happen for those who trust in God and devote themselves to doing what is good, not in the goodness of the world, but in the integrity of Christ. A complete faith that is excellent, and profitable for everyone. Not just you, not just our church, but for everyone. Fruitful as seen through history and design. I promise. This is the only way to fight the destructive influence of two-faced living. Again, we're going to show you grace and peace. And like, I'm after it. Now, some of us are young in this. Don't, we're not going to pick on you. But we know who has the intent. We know this is your cause. And we know who does not. We are wise enough to understand that. Now, on the other side of this coin, for those who are in it to, who are not in it to receive God's, well, let me do this before I go there. Let me give you a few things, Christians, that are in the, let me give you a few things to do uh, before we wrap things up and before I share what I was going to share. First, here's a couple things you can do. Number one, avoid foolish and stupid controversy. That's in your marriages, that's in your families, that's in church, that's anywhere. Avoid foolish and stupid controversies or matters. Take it, amen. Another thing to do is to avoid senseless culture, family, and religious expectations, habits, and traditions. Notice the three I said, culture, family, and religious traditions, because that is killing many a people. We can't change. We don't know how to transform. No. Please, please, please avoid those. How about this one? Keep clear of idiotic, thick-headed, and weak-minded arguments, philosophically speaking here, conversations and fights about who's right and wrong. Never forget the true Christian faith is not about being right, but living right together. And why would you waste your time on a monk? No matter who it is. Avoid these things because these things are unprofitable and useless in the success of the Lord. These are just, those are a few things you can do to hit that target. Now, for those who choose not to move forward, not apply it, you might be hearing it, but you're not going to apply it, let me speak to you now. For those who choose not to move forward in Jesus' goodness and continue in your phony baloney lifestyle, Here's the plan to resolve your uh, divisive and resistant attitude. We're going to put a plan in place right now, John. Here's the plan. Courageously, we who have decided to follow Jesus to gain God's holiness, righteousness, and justice, that's concrete action towards God's righteousness and holiness, when you fall down or when you fail or when your intent is noticed, and we, you fall into bad habits of duplicity or, or two-facedness, we'll show you all kinds of grace. Amen, John? The first time. And the second time. I promise you. If not, point them to me. We'll do that by first giving you a warning. We'll do it a second time. But if it happens, the third time. Understand will have nothing to do with you. Let that sink in. This is not out of spite or hate, but we do it because that's what the Word of God tells us to do when living good with the bad. Titus 3.10. Warn A, what's the next word? 
divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. This phony baloney of grace never ends in the sense of somebody who is not in it does not exist. We see that in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. We have to tighten things up. If not, we're going to miss the mark. If you don't believe me, just look at the culture and society. It's absolutely miserable. We've got to get things back into order. Now who here, let me ask this question, for the sake of Jesus' goodness and happiness, is willing to step up to the plate and give this type of feedback to those who choose to be troublesome or contentious in the faith? Will you have the courage and sacrifice your feelings to put in good order the reality of God in our day and age and and to live in the freedom of Christ? If you're willing to do so, raise your hand. Thank you. Oh, most of you. Now, if you meant it, then no, you're the mature ones I'm speaking to today. I appoint you to carry on what the Apostle Paul and Titus did in Crete in the space God has given you and us to do so. To do so in your marriages, uh, in your families, in, your, in the church, in, in work, in the communities, and, and beyond to the outer banks of the world. We want to do so to keep Christians accountable in the hope, faith, and love. Hear that. Don't worry about the phone. Let me say that again. We want to do so to keep Christians accountable in the faith, and hope, and love of Jesus. It's an assignment for all of us to live out God's goodness with the bad so that we can live successfully today and for future generations to come. Ending where we started, Titus 1.5. reason I, I left you now in the place you now sit was that you might put in order what was left unfinished 116 years ago at this church and appoint elders or people responsible in every position, in every town, as I direct you. Church, the message, living good with the bad. Amen.